The virus in the 21st century devastated humanity, with only around 2 million surviving the outbreak. The humans who survived the plague mysteriously lost their sense of sight. Currently, hundreds of years after the incident, vision is just a myth for human beings. In fact, the ability to see is considered to be blasphemy. The story opens in Alkani Village, an outpost in the Payan Kingdom that sits at the base of towering snow-capped mountains and is surrounded by dense forests. The isolated village is named after the Alkani tribe, whose faces are most notable for their deep scars and milky eyes. Historically, the Alkani did not have good relations with the Payan Kingdom. The tribe is led by a chieftain named Babavas, who rules as per the wishes of the people. However, religious authority inside the tribe is divided into two people. The first is the dreamer, a priest who maintains the spiritual health of the community. The second is an elderly woman named Paris who works as a midwife and advisor to Baba Voss. A form of democracy is practiced where each member of the tribe has a vote. The chieftain has the ability to call a parliament to discuss matters that concern the whole tribe. In the present day, in a cave, Baba Voss's wife, Magra is having a child and calls for Paris. Several months ago, Magra was found alone and pregnant in a storm near the borders of the village. She joined the Alchemy as a stranger but quickly ascended to the top of the social structure by marrying Baba Voss. Right now, she wants her husband to be by her side. But the continuous loud sound of a horn indicates that there is something bad happening outside. Paris explains a raiding party composed of men, horses, and dogs is coming toward the valley. Hence, a defense must be mounted to protect the village and its inhabitants. In charge of the village defense is Baba Voss, a tall, intimidating man with a bushy beard and bun. He has armbands decorated with gigantic animal claws and an enormous blade across his shoulder. One of Baba Voss's soldiers figures out the formation of the encroaching army thanks to her intensely heightened senses. The rest of the soldiers then fall behind their chieftain to meet their adversaries. Unfortunately, they soon realize that they are not being attacked by merely a raiding party. To their horror, it is actually an entire army of about 200 soldiers. Thus, they prepare for battle in the dense forest, engaging in a primal dance. Inside the cave, Paris helps Magra deliver her baby. She also confesses that for the past three nights, an owl has been telling her that the Witchfinders are on their way to the village. Witchfinders are a religious military force of the Pan Kingdom charged with seeking out individuals with sight. Bound by a holy oath, they are brutal and relentless, slaughtering anyone who opposes them. Paris believes that they have currently come to take Magra. The scene then immediately cuts to the invaders, who are led by Tamakti Jun, the general of the Witchfinders. He is searching for a non-religious criminal that killed the sister of the Queen of the Pan Kingdom. In his custody, Tamakti Jun has a member of the Alkani tribe named Gether Bax. The brutal general reveals that Gether Bax snitched on his own tribe for reward in return for valuable information. The trader had informed that at the end of winter, a three months pregnant woman wandered into Alkani village. She was then taken in by Babavas because he always wanted to have children. Although Magra never disclosed her baby's biological father, she did have a necklace. Unfortunately, Gether Bax also handed that to Tamakti Jun. Engraved on the necklace was the name of the criminal that the witchfinders seek, Jerlameral. Back in the cave, Magra delivers a son. Moments later, Paris discovers that there is a second baby too who is ready to come out. As she operates on Magra, the scene shifts back to the forest. Babavas and his fierce comrades engage the enemy from the top of a rock wall on a sloped hill. First, men tied to ropes, who hang over the edge of the wall strike at their adversaries below. Then the conflict evolves into ferocious hand-to-hand -hand combat. Babavas stabs his first victim with his armband claw, and then decapitates him with his blade. The fighting is brutal and swift despite none of the warriors having the sense of sight. Babavas and company win this skirmish by causing the rock wall to collapse into hundreds of rolling boulders. These wipe out the Witchfinder Battalion. The Alchemy then begin to retreat to their village. Meanwhile, Magra is compelled by tradition that says newborns must hear the names of their true father. She confesses to Paris that her kid's true father is Jerlameral. Later, Bada calls for a parliament where he says that the Witchfinder General will be mounting another siege as soon as the rain subsides. After urging everyone to prepare for another round of battle, he goes to visit Magra and the newborns. In the meantime, the parliament concludes that the witchfinders only arrived at the village to look for Magra's babies. They believe that if they hand the newborns to Tamakti Jal, their lives may be spared. Following this, a standoff ensues between Baba, a few of his loyal comrades and the rest of the village. But before they can come to blows, Paris informs everyone that the witchfinder army will arrive at the village
much sooner than later. However, she has a plan to save them from certain death. Historically, the Alchemy believed there was only one way in and out of the village. However, the man who brought Magra to Alchemy actually told Paris about a bridge that he built over a river. That bridge can grant them safe passage out of the village before they are attacked. However, most are skeptical about this because it seems impossible for a single man to have built a complete bridge. Yet with few options, they pack up and head for the bridge. After walking for a few hours, they do find the bridge. However, before they can all safely make it through, Tamakti Jun arrives and sends his dogs behind them. Fortunately, despite a few casualties, they make it safely across the bridge. Baba Voss then cuts the bridge down after letting Gether Bax cross over. He assumes that Gether was an unwilling prisoner rather than a collaborator. Forded, Tamakti Jun sends word via Hawk to Kane, the Queen of Pan Kingdom. The scene then shifts to the queen in her palace at Kanzua Dam, an ancient imposing building of concrete and metal. Bald except for a long ponytail, her minions cloth her in a robe. She sits in a chair, spreads her legs, licks her hand, and proceeds to pleasure herself while praying to God. Thanking him for granting the god flame, which in reality is the sun, she asks him to punish her enemies. She then orgasms, licks her finger, and says amen. After a while, she receives Tamakti Jun's message. She then calls for a meeting with her cabinet in a dark room illuminated by two rows of fire. There, they have a conversation about the devil Jerlameril, who murdered her sister and preached about vision. The queen suspects that he can see and could have passed his power of light on to his children. However, no one quite knows if that's possible. It is then revealed that Jerlameril was born to a slave and fed the queen and her servants in this very room. Kane's right-hand man suggests that Jerlameril may not have even been able to see but the queen is sure of it. Kane then explains that in the past, men used the power of sight to almost destroy the world, burning forests and polluting the air. She demands that Tamakti Jun be informed of his new mission, find the babies and bring them to her. At this point, the scene shifts to Baba Voss and his caravan. Magra tells the villagers about Jerlameril and his ability to see the world. Over the course of 30 days and nights, they follow Winchine like markers left by Jerlameril to a secure area. The area is protected by a waterfall, where the mystery man has left them supplies to build a new village. That night, Paris informs Baba of a prophecy. She says that although this place feels like paradise, he will be the chief of a tribe that must hide from the world and the witchfinders forever. The next morning, Baba holds his two adopted children and basks in the sun's rays. Unbeknownst to him, one of the infants stares up at an airborne hawk, proving that the newborns can see. A few days later, Baba Voss takes a morning stroll in the forest with his two kids. Unfortunately, he soon comes face to face with a fearsome bear who separates him from the two infants. However, he once again proves his combat medal, stabbing the bear repeatedly in the neck and torso. Yet before he can finish it off, an arrow zooms in out of nowhere and kills the bear. That arrow is shot by none other than Jerlameril. He emerges from the trees to give Baba a key to a box hidden in a cave near the village's waterfall. He asks Baba to inform Paris about the container too, and says it is to be given to the kids when they are 12 summers old. When asked what's inside, Jerlameril says it contains knowledge that will make a world better than that of their ancestors. He then tells Baba to name the kids Haniwa and Kafun, so he'll know them when they finally find him. After this brief conversation, he promptly vanishes once more. This encounter concerns Baba, who wants to be the kids' only father and doesn't want them to ever leave. It also upsets Gether Bax, who hears Baba calling out Jerlameril's name. With this intel, Gether goes to his aunt, Souter Bax. Their conversation reveals that Gether's mother was burned alive for challenging the decision of making Baba the chieftain of the Alchemy tribe. In those days, Baba had recently joined the tribe and would not give any information about his past. Still enraged by the loss of his mother, Gether vows to avenge her. Hence, he and Souter arrange a secret forest meeting with a shadow. The shadow is a mysterious figure who conceals her true identity from the rest of the clan and can hide her body from detection. Gether asks her to spy on Paris, a request that she accepts. Later that night, in their hut, Baba and Magra are joined by Paris to unlock the trunk. Inside is a toy boat and, more important still, a collection of books. Although Baba does not understand the importance of the gifts, Paris understands that these are the keys to wisdom. She reveals that the book contains the secrets of the Age of Vision. Magra isn't happy about this or the kid's possible ability to see since she fears it'll just bring misfortune upon them. Nonetheless, she agrees to bury the books until the kids are 12. Paris then detects that the shadow is watching them and informs Baba of this by scribbling it on his palm with her finger, but he fails to catch the shadow before she departs. Following this, the shadow reports back together about the meeting. In a surprising twist, she lies, saying that the trio only talked about mundane childcare stuff. 
Gether doesn't believe her and tells Souter that he plans to send news of the witch Jerlomero by tossing bottled up messages downstream until one is found. In the following scene, Baba goes to see Gether and lets him know that he's aware of their dislike for him. He intimidates Gether by explaining that he's a fair man, so long as people come to him with problems. Sneaking around behind his back, however, will force Baba to revert back to his old violent self. Elsewhere, Tamakti Jun is having no luck tracking down Jerlomeril, and beats a clueless villager out of frustration. Back at the palace, Queen Kane listens as a messenger reads a letter from Tamakti Jun. The letter tells her about his failure, and he asks to abandon his mission to return home. But, Kane doesn't believe this message and reads it for herself. She identifies it as a false knot forgery. Eventually, the messenger admits that he forged the letter. For that deception, Kane slits the guy's throat with a tiny blade she keeps implanted in her wrist. Then, Kane begins to pray while a woman pleasures her. Surprisingly, she calls Jerlamail her one true love, and prays for him to come back to her. She wants him to give her children with his power of sight. By doing this, she'll renounce the gods, because she and her kids will become gods themselves. Following this, she holds a public execution for the two more traitors, who attempted to trick her with the false knot. The public criticize Cain for caring more about Jerlomero than the fact that the dam's engines are breaking down, and the water is rising, but she counters by proclaiming that she's God's hand on earth. It is then revealed that Cain uses the electricity from the dam to warm the winters and cool the summers in the homes of her citizens but she claims it to be magic. She then demonstrates that power by hoisting the two backstabbers in the air, by chains and frying them with turbine-generated electricity. The scene then jumps three years into the future. The new alchemy village is built, and Magra shows Paris that Hanua and Kafun can see. Baba also confesses he too has known about this for some time. When Magra wants to deny them the contents of Jerlomero's box, Paris convinces her to keep following his instructions. Then, as a bedtime story, Magra tells the twins a fable about how the four senses, scent, taste, sound, and touch, were happy until they were visited by a long-lost fifth brother, Vision. Vision comments about their physical appearance leading to strife between the brothers. Eventually, they rejected Vision and regained harmony. Via this fable, Magra instills in Haniwa and Coffin the idea that their gift is a curse, and that they must therefore live as if they were blind. At the conclusion of the montage accompanying that tale, the kids are now on the cusp of their twelfth birthday. Nagra has decided to keep the box from them, forever, but Paris objects and shows it to them anyway. She also informs them that the contents are books and that their true father, Jerlomero, gave it to them. This bombshell revelation rocks their world. Enraged, Coffin storms out, and Paris sends Hanua after him. Outside, kneeling beside a hearth, Hanua reads the message left by Jerlomero. It says that once upon a time, all humans had the power of sight, but they outgrew the earth and destroyed it. As a result, God punished humanity and saved the world by stripping them of sight. Now, however, this power has been restored in certain chosen people, and the kids should find him when they're strong enough to leave the village. That night, Baba learns of Paris' actions and confronts her. She convinces him that it was just and that it should be hidden from Magra. She argues that, after all the terrible things Baba has seen and done, he owes it to the world to provide it with the hope embodied by Haniwa and Kafun. Few years later, Haniwa and Kafun, who are now teenagers, climb up the waterfall to read. In the meantime, on a distant riverbed, a young girl finds one of Gather Bax's bottles. Meanwhile, at Kanzua Dam, Tamakti Jun arrives with 100 carts of goods for Queen Kane. However, he doesn't have Jerlomero, as the Queen had demanded. Thus, he accepts his failure and the subsequent execution as punishment, but he asks that he be allowed to kill himself. This brings Kane to tears, but she realizes that Tamakti Jun's inability to capture the Jerlomero threatens her entire empire. Meanwhile, Hanua shows off her new bow to Baba while hunting turkeys. She created the weapon thanks to the books left by Jerlomero. Baba is simultaneously impressed and troubled. However, he tells her not to kill a deer because it'll be impossible to explain to Magra how they bagged one without letting her know that the books have been read. At the waterfall, Haniwa draws her bow and arrow and points it toward her fellow villagers. She tells Kafun that she could kill them and blame it on the god flame, which she knows is just the sun. Understanding that his sister has a disturbing violent streak, Kafun chastises her for thinking the books are simply there to teach them how to construct better weapons. Haniwa is also excited about the world atlas she has. It tells her that the river in their village leads to the Mississippi River, and that there's an industrial town called Pittsburgh, likely the geographic location of Queen Kane's Kanzua Dam. 
Meanwhile, Souderbox gives birth to a stillborn baby, which came out not looking like a human. Gether blames Baba, Paris, and the rest of the witches for this abomination. However, everyone else recognizes it to be the byproduct of incest. Since there are only about 70 people in the village, everyone knows the symptoms of inbreeding. Hence, a decision is made to venture to a nearby festival, where prospective new clan members and mates might be found. Baba fears such travel will lead the witchfinders to their hidden home. But Magra says that tough times will inevitably drive people away, and that steering them in the right direction is the best way to manage the situation. In Kanzu Adam, Kane stops Tamakti Jun from killing himself. She has received the Gatherback's bottle, meaning she knows where to locate the kids. Elsewhere, Baba and company travel to a nearby festival. They eventually reach their destination, situated in the ruins of an amusement park from a bygone era. There are traders of all sorts here, as well as religious extremists who burn the non-religious at the stake for being able to see. The fact that these victims cannot, in fact, see horrifies Haniwa, but she can't do anything about it without outing herself. Soon afterwards, Kafun is abducted by slavers and marched to an enormous industrial complex with a collection of other prisoners, including a young injured girl named Fethin. Tracking them, Haniwa discovers a message on an old car written by Kafun, I am alive, follow the path. With no other option left, she reveals this to Baba, Paris, and Magra. This means that her mom now knows that she can read and write, and disobeyed her by studying the books. But, Magra doesn't press the issue because rescuing Kafun supersedes all other issues. Upon reaching the industrial compound, Baba confesses that he knows the place because he comes from a long line of slavers. Moreover, he reveals that he was once a slaver raised to chain and sell innocent people. He buried that version of himself long ago. But now, he must do what he swore to never do, wake up his violent self. Determined not to let his loved ones see, Baba goes alone. Inside, Baba dispatches many of his foes by slicing their necks with ease. Baba uses unique maneuvers dictated by his blindness. He tosses sand pebbles on the ground to hear others' movements, and slides his blade across the floor to fool enemies about his location. However, Baba is unable to carry out this slaughter in total secrecy. Even though Kafun obeys his dad's commands to shield his eyes, Haniwa shows up at the last second to take out a bad guy with one of her arrows. This indicates that she's seen her father's violent side. After the dust settles down, Kafun apologizes to Magro, but she stalks away, anguished. Her anger subsides once back at the village, as Kafun informs her that everything he's read and seen over his 17 summers makes him want to stay at home. Haniwa, on the other hand, admits that what she's read, as well as her power to kill, makes her want to leave. However, she's scared of what she is and can do. In the ending scene, Magra announces that it's finally time to tell the kids, as well as Baba and Paris, about Jerlomero, a man whose goodness was consumed by power. But when Baba goes to call Paris for this meeting, he hears dogs in the distance. Unfortunately for him, these belong to Tamakti Jun, who stands atop the waterfall with his army, ready to attack. Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on the notification, and leave 1000 likes or 100 comments if you'd like us to continue part 2. Thank you.